What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Discuss Metal Podcast. My name is Dan. I'll be your host for this evening. Joe is here as our What's up, everybody? As as our wonderful co-host slash main host. It just depends on how he decides to view it or how much work he actually ends up having to do to the conversation before and after. Uh, tonight we have two very special guests for you. We've got Don and Kevin from Bastard Squad. What's How's up, going? guys? What's up, man? Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah Not that's much. An intro. Thank you. Yep. This is uh this is Don's second time on the show. Um back before the world just went absolutely to garbage. Mm-hmm. Uh Don was kind enough to drive down and sit in uh sit in the studio. I think he was sitting right where Joe's dog kennel is now. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and we were we sat down and had a wonderful conversation about punk rock, about ro- about hard rock, metal, hardcore, and then we talked a lot about Repo Man. I remember that a lot. <laughs> and a lot has happened. Nine. Lots of creepy movies. Yep. Yeah, a lot has happened with me and Repo Man over the last uh, year. Oh, oh yeah, do tell. Weirdly. Yeah, yeah. Let's go into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I started a collaboration thing with. Uh, the guy from Adam Age Industries. I don't know okay. if you guys have heard of them. They do like horror shirts, a lot of shirts and stuff, some reissues of like fear, shit like that. And they picked up the first official Repo Man merch line. Oh, and cool. I showed the guy the poster from the screening that we did last year. And uh, he was really excited about it. So he sent it off to Alex Cox, the director of Repo Man got it approved, and then now in my shop you can pick up uh, an official glow-in-the-dark poster that's signed by Alex Cox, the director, as well as a T-shirt bundle, (laughs) all official, all licensed. That is awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. When everything shut down, we couldn't do anything. I had to get inventive with what I was doing. So working on collaborations like that, putting out exclusives for the shop, and – more records on the record label that's super cool yeah and i'm gonna we're gonna get into that a little bit too um but before we before we jump into it um there's something uh joe's gonna throw up on the screen here real quick um absolutely give me just a moment with that so you guys have a new uh lp coming out Mm -hmm. and um this is the alexian sessions yeah and uh, don't don't hit me with one of those. No, it's actually a leak C A N <laughs> sessions. Get it right. Um, yeah. But yeah, just uh, just you know, I I, I had I, I I had the pleasure of kind of giving it a, a a spin. Not the LP. I don't have the LP, but uh, I will. Not yet. But um, yeah, not yet. I'll get it when everybody else gets it. Uh, but the uh, so if if you just want to tell me a little bit about this release, um, I know that this was recorded uh, more or less in a live setting. Yeah. Yeah, so we did a live streaming event with uh, <clears throat> all proceeds going to St. Louis Crisis Nursery, which are which is an absolutely great organization. And we were really happy with the way everything turned out. So we said, let's do a live record because we had actually talked about doing a live record and doing a recording of our record release show for Bastard Luck. And due to some technical glitches, that didn't really, <laughs> didn't really manifest. So when we got the the mp3s back from this performance we decided to pick the best songs and let's do a let's do a live record and you know as me and don were talking about it you know we were talking about ways we could make it unique and i've always loved single-sided lps that are screen printed on the back that show through so we said hey single-sided lp screen printed back mm-hmm. yeah it's super it's super cool looking and i'm i'm uh Oh, he's even got another one. So for the release of this, you guys are actually, um, you guys are actually going to do a CD release party, which is kind of exciting. Just the concept of a live show, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> at, at all, <Yeah. laughs> coming up uh, as soon as on April twenty fourth. Um, how did how did that come about? Or you just decided that now's the time? Yeah, we actually did a live show at Red Flag. What was that? October. Thereabouts. Yeah. November last year. Um, we were actually surprised it even happened with uh, the way things were going, but they took everything super seriously, uh, 10% capacity. So we were allowed to have a hundred 
people in a place that holds about 1200. So imagine, uh, 65 to 70 people showing up to pops and spreading out in seats that were scattered everywhere. Wow. Plenty of space. Um, they kept everything clean. You had to wear a mask, temperature check at the door. Yeah. Uh, it was super chill. Everybody was really cool. Nothing happened. We just had a good time. And so when we were going into this release, we figured let's give them a shot again. Plus it supports the venue, you know, uh, they had just built, yeah. yeah, right. They had just built red flag and it just never could take off the way it was supposed to. So outside of, well, back then our show, everything was kind of like, just like local metal bands that would play to the other bands, you know, stuff like that. Um, so we were trying to help them as well. So this is kind of the continuation of that. Um, and then this record coming out. That's super cool. It's, it's, it's kind of rough too, though. Cause you got to think, I guess nobody get nobody can get up and mosh or, you know, rush right. the stage or any of the stuff that you would really, really want from a show like that. Yeah. But we did have uh what about eight or nine kids arm linked uh, head banging. So that was cool. Oh, that is cool. <laughs> <laughs> high school age thrasher kids and it was, hell uh, yes it was, it was kind of cool because later i found out it was almost like a full circle moment because one of the kids that was like actually the main kid in the group is the nephew of a guy i used to play in hardcore bands with 20 years ago oh yeah. wow that's super cool that's fun and it's it's fun seeing kind of kind of the younger generation kind of kind of kind of going in and supporting like local bands you know like hometown bands mm-hmm. uh because I just feel like kind of in this day and age, so much music that's consumed by younger people. I'm showing my age here with this whole monologue here. Uh, but younger back people, in my day, we had cassette tapes. Back and we in drove my day, around yeah. in our stereo with the car, and we were happy with it. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but most of it's consumed online, you know, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I almost said MySpace, but I didn't. Um, but, Fuck, dude. Yeah. <laughs> But, it, you know, it, we, we kind of have a lot of people that, that just listen to 10 seconds of a song and they make a snap judgment about your band based on those 10 seconds of audio. So it's it's really cool seeing um, seeing kid, you know, younger kids kind of show up for uh, for, for these types of shows and it not just be like a bunch of dudes that are here that, you know, were in the scene 30 years ago, <laughs> you know, that were, um, you know, just reliving the glory days, which I mean, I'm sure those are there, too. You know, I actually really, and I don't mean this in a condescending way. I feel bad for the younger, the the younger kids discovering music nowadays. Because you know, when Jesus, when I was in high school in the early '90s, you know, we get like whatever distro catalog from whatever record label, and you thumb through the newsprint, and you'd have to like throw your money down and take a chance on a record. You know, was the album cover cool? It's back when four fans of actually meant something, and you know, you'd have a record label that you pretty much liked everything they put out because they were, they did what they did and they did it well. And I I just feel like for the younger generation, that joy of discovery has been taken away by this instant gratification you can get. Not at the record space, especially with like live shows. And well, no, you know, those kids and they're going on Friendster and leaving testimonials (laughs) for bands, but you know, it's, you you go uh, back when you know, I was in high school, you showed up to the show, you showed up, when the show started, you stayed to the end because mm-hmm. you didn't know anything about the openers, and that was the only way you're going to find out about them. Um, <clears throat> two last two years ago, my other band played in Chicago, and they had this really kind of neat model about their their shows that they were doing. I thought was something I wish more local scenes would kind of pick up. You know, when you got a minor level regional touring band, they don't announce the the order till you get to the show. So if you want to make sure you're going to want to see the band you want to see, they've set it up so you have to show up because the band you want to see might be playing fifth, they might be playing first, but you don't know until you walk through the door. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I remember from playing shows years ago, and I'm sure this is still true. You get the band that's clearly the biggest draw, and they want to play third because Mm -hmm. third is the best spot. But when Mm -hmm. you've got five six seven sometimes more bands on the fucking bill it's kind of frustrating to see 
the big draw be there at nine o'clock? I almost mm-hmm. expect them to start playing at ten thirty, like they used to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, too many bands on a bill uh, is something I learned pretty quickly putting shows together not to do. <laughs> Keeping it at like three, short and sweet. Everybody comes early, drinks, has a good time, watches everybody, and then leaves. Mm-hmm. And um, they kind of expect, oh, it's all going to happen within two and a half hours, you know, versus five hours. Yeah, and it's. It, I remember too. That was kind of a way that we, because I remember in St. Louis for a while there, we had. Um, I don't want to say anything about the about the promoters themselves because a lot of them were really cool and were like friends of mine, but I remember it always being one of those things where they they they'd get like a really they'd get like a big touring band, uh to to agree to come down and play a show you know maybe because it's a tour stop or it's or or whatever and um and then they would call all they would call me and all of my friends bands <laughs> and be like hey uh this is a festival <laughs> <laughs> and so everybody everybody would show up at uh. Everybody would show up at the venue at like eight thirty in the morning to sound check, and you'd start the show at like nine thirty, ten o'clock, and then like by twelve hours later, you've got you know this big touring band <laughs> that's playing, and uh, and then I remember the next day, and like none of us would make any money. We we might get like pizza or something, you know, but like for the most part, we didn't make any money, and we usually had to be on the ground selling tickets uh, for that mm-hmm. festival, mm-hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, it, it, I started realizing that giant shows like that pretty early on were basically just scams <laughs> for dudes to get paid for, uh, for for guys to get paid on a on a touring band that they didn't necessarily think was going to bring a very big draw. Yeah, you know, like the, around 2010, the height of that like one day fest that were just absolutely bullshit. Yep. Yeah, but usually you got to also think like some of these things. There's so much money wrapped up in some sort of guarantee Mm -hmm. that they have to make back. So, you know, it happens. I mean, I always just look at everything as, uh, are we going to have a good time? Is everybody going to have a good time? You know, money's cool, I guess. It might fund your next record or something, but uh, mostly, yeah, I don't give a shit. (laughs) Yeah. Not that I want that out there, but we're more into just having a good time. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Well, and I think that like it, it's as much as you know, you want to say it's a scam. That's how I felt as a as a mm-hmm. as a kid, you know. Oh, it can feel like that, old or, you know, whatever. Like, oh, these guys are just ripping us off. They're they're exploiting it, and we've got like what, like a two song demo, you know, mm-hmm. that's burned <laughs> too. You know, we we show up at the show with like a stack of like a hundred CDRs with two songs on it, and and we sold at least half of them. Be fair. Well, what was cool? What was cool about those shows though is I found out about a lot of bands. Yeah. And that stuff still there, you know. Yeah. We don't need to go into that stuff, but Oh, but the the 2010s business model for any hardcore band was record a four song demo and then immediately go on tour. Right, yeah. And then uh 2020 you get the repress of the demo on 7 inch for the first time. Absolutely. I mean, those were great days. It was like my wedding night. It's like, like get ready for the most intense 15 minutes of your life. You know, um, you know, you're playing, you're playing long sets. Absolutely. Super long <laughs> set. Um, Man, if you but, think that's long when you come to our show, we got like an hour. <laughs> that's going to be a good time. Well, that, that was a big adjustment for me uh, coming from mm-hmm. playing in hardcore bands. Uh, Jesus, for since 2000 and joining Bastard Squad and go, coming back to punk rock and you know, going from playing 15, 20 minute intense sets with uh, in a small room with the fuck you horseshoe to playing 30, 45 minute sets where people are up front and actually paying attention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of camaraderie, I think, to that scene, you know, that is uh, something that something that I really, really enjoyed watching. You know, one of my favorite things about watching a lot of the punk bands in St. Louis was how all of these bands. <clears throat> All of these bands that you started off as punk rock bands that maybe I knew dudes in high school or whatever, they had all basically either become hardcore bands or thrash bands within five years. And so it's funny watching how the overall musical landscape will operate in a like the evolution of a style of music will happen on the local level 
just like it happened in kind of the the, the general level. Um, and I always thought that that was kind of cool, just seeing the amount of support. Um, because when we were when we played in St. Louis, it was one of those things where we were just hopping. We played kind of more of a trendy style of of hardcore, like the hot topic hardcore kind of kind of stuff. And so nobody nobody ever came out for that. But then like some band that we'd never even heard of before would come on and they'd be the headliner and there'd be like we'd be playing there'd be like 15 people there and then like uh the bigger band would come on and uh, we had no idea that they were the bigger band and that's whenever you start seeing like 150 200 kids piling through the door <laughs> and yeah. it ends up being one of the best shows that we've seen in years you know yeah well i think for us we kind of just go by the old model of promote your own shit you know, um, back in the day, punk bands hung flyers. You told all your friends, reminded everybody over and over and over, <laughs> make sure you come out. And yeah. that's how I operate. So I just beat everybody over with the head with it until they show up. <laughs> I mean, we, we act like it's 96 with our promotion. Yeah. You know, yeah. Too, too many people really gotten gotten to feel super safe with social media and you know, there's a lot of people who want to be promoters. They think, oh, I booked the show. I set up the venue. I sent out 200 Facebook invites. My job is done. And it's right. No, nah, like we, we do flyers. We go out and we hang them. We word of mouth promotion. Just, you know, it's like that's, that's what we did when we were dumbass teenagers in the mid 90s. And mm -hmm. it worked back then and it still works today. The, taking a long break from everything that probably helped. Because yeah. uh, yeah. nothing changed in my brain. I was like, oh, you do it like this. It's like Encino, man. Like, I got to do everything the way you did it when you left. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> I didn't That's... know things changed. Well, they well, definitely I mean... changed a little bit mm -hmm. as far as the promotion style. And I, I think you're right that people got extremely comfortable with social media. Mm -hmm. But I'm starting to notice, and I wonder if you guys are too, the social media overwhelmingly being the social media overhaul that seems to be happening. Cause like my niece, she's not on Facebook, her favorite bands. They're not rock bands. She's mm -hmm. way into like hip hop now with mm -hmm. like crash Minotti and doobie and all of those. What I thought were underground artists mm -hmm. and where are they? snapchat yep so we're seeing things change again mm -hmm. even though it's still social media it's just yep. not the method of facebook shoving the ads down your throat like you used to be able to do mm -hmm. it's like now the algorithm is actually working against promotion sometimes oh it 100 percent works against promotion and i think that's why a lot of people are starting to yeah, there's like a, I don't want to say it's a mass exodus from Facebook, but Facebook's not nearly as important for music promotion as it was just a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing the same thing with Instagram, with the way they do their, their Instagram seems to be taking a very similar business model to Facebook. Well, I, I also think that when it comes to those acts, like you were talking about those artists, you know, work on those platforms in a more direct way to their fans. So people feel more connected, like they're talking to their friend, you know? So this might be an artist who has millions of followers. They open up Snapchat live, everybody tunes in like it's your buddy, you know what I mean? And then they all feel connected. So when they go on tour, everyone's going to show up because it's your friend, you know, yep. this artist who you'd never have an interaction with any other, you know, time in our lives now is on the same platform you and all your buddies are on, you know? What's well, the accessibility? Yeah. And and formats like Snapchat <clears throat> offer more accessibility than like a Facebook or an Instagram. It's it, it's kind of like taking an old model and putting it to technology. Like I remember going down to uh, the Blue Note in Columbia sometime around 97, 98 to see uh, Brian Setzer Orchestra because my the guy I was in a band with at the time was a huge, huge Brian Setzer fan. And, uh, you know, he wanted to meet him. And we went out and Brian Setzer stayed out there probably till two or three in the morning, shaking every hand, signing every CD, signing every shirt. Mm -hmm. He didn't leave till everybody else left. And in my head, it clicked. I was like, that's why he's still packing venues like that years after his relevance. 
Yep. Yeah. It's yeah. That accessibility and that connection. Um, yep. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, have you guys ever gone to a Bruce Campbell signing? Yeah. He does. He does basically the same thing, and he just has this interaction with his fans, and that's really how he's carried his career as long as he has. Yeah, yeah, he has this kind of air to him where he, uh, number one, almost acts surprised that you're there mm-hmm. and then immediately falls it like, look, oh, I'm so thank you so much for coming to, you know, like and, and it, like it might sound cliche to some people. But like when you're there in the moment, shaking, the, shaking the hands with somebody that you have a lot of respect for and just knowing that they've got respect for you and that, like, they recognize that they're only they're The only reason that they're there is is for is to talk to you, to see you, to, you know, mm-hmm. Um, and I, yeah, I think that that sort of stuff's cool. And I think it lends a lot to, to, to your guys' model of, yeah, we go out, we hang flyers, you know, um, if, if a guy walks up to me in 2021 and hands me a flyer to go see his band, I'm going to go see that band. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Cause it's just one of those, like, there's not a whole lot of people that are, that are still doing that. But I think the coolest thing that bastard squad has going, uh, really is, is the store. Um, yeah. having that kind of kind of kind of having that that I almost want to call it like that safe haven where you can just go in and you can hang out with people that like the music that you like. Mm-hmm. You can you can hear about shows, you can you can, you know, and you you know, if you if you go and see Bastard Squad and then you know you cut you come into the store, you get you know, you get to hang, you get to talk to Don, you get to do you get to do all these things and really, really be a part of that community. And I think that that I think that that's super cool. It's something that like when I was working at a game store, I wish that we had had some sort of outlet outside of the game store, yeah. you know, <laughs> for something like that. And I think it's, I think it's really cool what you have going on because it's like, I can just drive. I mean, shoot, I live probably like just a, what a 20 minute drive down from 30 and I yeah. definitely don't come up and hang out nearly enough, but <laughs> um, yeah. having, having that as an option is, is incredible. In this right. Day. You know, I'll be here. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm up here uh, about every other Friday hanging out, and it's it's a lot of fun talking to people that come in, especially some of the younger kids, and seeing what they're buying. And mm-hmm. you know, they're buying CDs from when I was in high school, and it's just <laughs> kind of yeah, kind of fun to fun to see. And sometimes, you know, everybody shows up at the same time. You might come in here, and uh, the other day there was the people from Red Bait, um, the people from Time and Pressure people from the band playing our bill uh, opening dead pilgrim yeah. so it's like everybody's just hanging out in the aisles talking they didn't mean to come up at the same time they just all happened to and then sometimes customers off the street might come in and get confused yeah <laughs> why are all these people standing around talking loudly especially right now uh not like everybody's wearing masks and everything of course but sure um most of these people haven't seen each other in so long, you know? So my place is definitely that kind of safe haven for you to come to, you know, it's clean. Um, and there's, yeah, just keep it cool. You know, even in the COVID situation, you know, I'm definitely yeah. going to have to come up because yeah. Kevin, you got that Aladdin saying behind you. I'm going to need that like last yeah. week. <laughs> that's, I have the record and that's the t-shirt from uh, Adam age industries. Yeah. Fuck yes. That is so cool. Yeah, and that that's one of the one of my favorite things to do when I'm up there is just kind of like just look at everything with, that's that's hanging up and, and and all of that. What does Don have this week? Yeah, like it and it's funny cuz I remember I came in a long time ago and I was like, "Man, I I've been trying to find destroy all monsters. I got this terrible VHS tape of it or whatever." And you're like, "Dude, I got it on Blu-ray right here." <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh." Yeah, right. you know. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I just built what I know and, you know, incorporating the band into everything was definitely thought about in the early stages of me doing anything, you know, like let's keep all of it together, you know, so it's all in one house and all comes from one place kind of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. It looks awesome. And I, I, um, one of the things that I like the most about it too, is I, every time I've been in there, everybody is so friendly and it, it's such a it's such an against the grain view of how people would have viewed a shop like that. I think even in the '90s, um, you know, it's like oh, you walk in there, there's a bunch of punks in there. What it's going to be like, or whatever. Except everybody's like super friendly and encouraging and <laughs> and and positive. And um, you know, it's, yep. it, you've got you've got records from every genre you can think of, 
And then it's also cool that, you know, right there in the front prominently, you know, people can buy your records as well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, People will say shameless self-promotion, but there's no such thing. No, not at all. (laughs) Who's going to promote it if you're not going to, you know? Yeah. Nobody. Absolutely. (laughs) Certainly not Facebook ads, you know? But I still don't sell Nickelback. So sorry. Oh, man. Please tell me there's a sign on one of the windows that says we do not sell Nickelback. Yeah, I've I've never ordered it. Uh, I've had it brought in once. <laughs> it, it left immediately. <laughs> Somebody came in and just snatched it right up, right? <laughs> yep, the trash <laughs> file thirteen. <laughs> the trash was super thirsty. <laughs> yeah. It needed some of that silver side up. Uh, yep. Nickelback. Awful. Well, That's that a- and, uh, Ted Nugent's novel that went in the trash. Oh yeah! How did you even get that? Did somebody Traded sell that in, to you? Yeah. Oh okay. You're like, yeah, that's gonna be. What's a really insulting number? Because if I say zero, it makes me look like a snob. So what do we think? Uh, eight cents? Yeah. <laughs> Nine cents? I'll give actually you... one time I put a copy of uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween Two DVD on the floor for zero dollars and zero zero cents, and <laughs> it sat here forever. And finally, one guy brings it up, and he's like, "So how much is this actually?" <laughs> And you're like, I can think, you read? I wasn't here at the time. I think uh, the guy said five dollars. He bought it. That's awesome. But I was like, no, it's free. I, the movie's awful. <laughs> What's that guy's number? I got to give him his five bucks back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was supposed to be free, man. That movie. Ugh. But we don't have to get into Rob Zombie right now. No, it's all good. We we did a whole we did a whole discography <laughs> discussion about Rob Zombie. <laughs> yeah, I had I, to, I I had to guy, do all of know. it. Yeah, long as the discography discussion ended with the last white zombie record is we're good we haven't uh, done white zombie yet we haven't we had we had james uh the james from cinemassacre we had him on for that one and nice. he uh he just sat there and told us all about rob zombie for <laughs> hours nice so dan yeah. can we go do a live show up at the record space and just talk about white zombie well, we we could i mean yeah uh, we have to ask don it wouldn't be the again. first time uh, we've had a live podcast in here we we have done it fuck yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be super cool. Um, and I think that like, okay, well, I, I some, something I wanted to get into, and I know it's kind of a dead horse at this point, but I'm always kind of curious um, how you guys as a band, number one, how you guys as a band survived through 2020 and how, how the store survived through 2020. Cause that's something that's kind of inspirational for me because I got to admit, I was kind of worried there for a little bit. Yeah. Well, Don can speak on the store. I'll, I'll speak on the band. Um, okay. I think we got real lucky because about a month or so in, in, into the COVID lockdown, our guitar player quit. Okay. And so we were, momentum was going great for us. We just played the attic show. We had got a great response. Things were good. We had all this, you know, couple couple tours lined up and just shows ready to go that were what what shows we lost because of it that we had in the pipeline make me cry mm-hmm. oh, they were no. incredible but we lost our guitar player and so we used that time to bring in our new guitar player josh who's bass player in break mouth annie uh we had already been working with him he had done uh keys live for a couple shows for us and, and back at guitar ones we fizzle out with our guitar player so we had josh waiting in the wings so while everybody was on pause, we were back in the practice space. We were working, working the new set together. We were writing new songs. Uh, we came out, you know, I think leaner and meaner than most other bands. I, I, I know a lot of people, I'm friends with, obviously I'm friends with a lot of musicians because I've been doing this for over half my life, but I, I know a lot of them still aren't practicing. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's been a year since they got in the same room together. It's right nobody's ready to try to tackle a show and it's either from very understandable cautiousness to other people are just, they don't want to be the first out there playing. They don't want to be the band. That's like, you know, Oh, uh, like some anonymous dickhead <laughs> post called us, <laughs> called us a COVID squad because right. we have a show coming up. Are you uh, boys going to cause a super spreader event? Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, well, you're like, I have, hope so. That's how you respond. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jesus, if we have enough fans to do that, that would be incredible. But you know, we, um, we prefer to keep things, uh, you know, calm and uh, respectful with people. 
and uh, make sure that does not happen. We would actually never play a show if we thought that was going to happen. Uh, we took that very seriously, that decision. And even going back into the practice, um, we took time off to see what was going to happen. And when it seemed like this wasn't going to end, uh, we we decided to go back because playing together was probably the only thing that was going to keep us sane through this sure. shit, you know? And so we, we took a lot of precautions too when we first started practicing again. Uh, we, we took what, about six weeks off. Yeah. And then we got back in the room and it was, you know, strict rules, but everybody kept the mask on. If you wanted to go have a beer, you went in the hallway. If you wanted to smoke, you went in the hallway. Like we still do know. that too. Yeah. yeah. I we're, still we're sing still behind cautious. yeah, a, a blockade of plastic. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> but you yeah. know, we, we came out of it with new material. Um, we're actually going in the studio tomorrow to record yeah. for an upcoming release that uh we'll we'll be announcing closer to when it's ready uh because there's been so many delays and pressing plants so mm -hmm. we're, right we're, we're waiting for all the announcements till it's closer to being a reality for yeah sure. people don't realize how many layers of uh upset i guess uh with uh covid that has rippled and destroyed so much shit. like besides uh, all the lives and health of people, which is awful. Um, the, uh, I mean, even pressing plants are screwed, you know, and we pressed cause CDs the other day, uh, which should have only taken a couple weeks and Canada is going into a third wave right now. And we're told we might not have them. So oh, wow. they were guaranteed Shit. to ship on Monday and two day delivery. And now we don't know if we're getting them because COVID's still rampaging through everywhere, you know? Right. So everything's affected, you know? Yeah. It's a wild yeah, I don't time. Think I've, I don't think I've ordered a single vinyl record this year that I've actually gotten yet. Mm. And definitely <laughs> yeah. not on time. <laughs> no, no, not not at all. Like everything's – because it's funny because you'll, you'll put your pre-order in and then release date comes by and then eventually they'll send a message being like, yeah, we're delayed by – Mm-hmm. Anywhere from three weeks to six months, you know. Yeah. Pressing <laughs> and a record went, a big question mark. You know, yeah, like, it went from I wanna say they said when we did our first record, it was eight weeks, I think, for to completion. Now it's we have a guarantee of fourteen weeks from one place. And wow. that's uh fast. Most yeah. places are five to six, seven months. So it's uh changed. Everything's changed, you know. So we're doing as much as we can. Uh, the record store, I was shut down for three months or so, three and a half months. Yeah. Um, so while we were also dealing with all the fallout of all of our shows disappearing, I was sitting at home like, what am I going to do? You know, you open a brand new business and I mean, this might be it, you know? Yeah. Um, luckily, I had you know, same thing we talked about earlier with a uh, community surrounding my shop. Uh, I had a GoFundMe that went well, everybody came out, uh, made t-shirts. I gave it all back. Um, it was only a temporary hold till I could reopen. Um, when I reopened, I used the money to make some cool stuff for everybody, gift cards and whatever. So anybody who donated got uh, a free t-shirt and a gift card and stuff. I spread all the money back out uh, across these gift cards evenly to everybody who gave money. So you could give five bucks or 500. Everyone got the same amount spread out. That's awesome. So That's awesome. I did something like that um, and it went well. And then I just started kind of getting back to it, you know, um, slowly minding all the precautions. You know, if you come in here, I still sit in an aquarium. <laughs> There's... Yeah. Lexi all around me. So mm -hmm. uh, you have to wear a mask. Um, I know a lot of places are starting to ease up on that, but uh, obviously, as we can see around us, this isn't over, you know? So I try to keep everything cool, ventilation up, you know, mask and everything. And everybody has been coming in, you know? Yeah. Slowly but surely, people are coming back. Um, and it's been well, you know? Yeah, no, it was super cool because I remember kind of watching that from the sidelines and it being one of those. I remember at one point you were considering even like 
yeah, it, you know, it just if you take your stuff that you want to trade and put it outside on a box, I'll come by and look at it or whatever, yeah. you know. Yeah, and uh, I did porch delivery and all that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll still do that. It, it doesn't matter if it's COVID times or not. If you called and said, I want that record, my leg's broken, I'll bring it to your house. Right. <laughs> like, that was never an issue, you know. Um, I've done that many times, you know. People would be like, oh, I really want to come get that, but I can't make it out. Yeah. I'm not doing anything after work. I'll just drive it by your house, you know? So, yeah. Yes, you, within within reason, right? <laughs> if, you're, I mean, if you're in California, I, I guess if you're willing to pay for travel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've driven it out to, you know, from St. Charles to Belleville, Illinois. I don't really care. You know, once I'm off, I usually just go home and work on other stuff. So getting somebody something cool to watch that night or a, li- a record they want to listen to, you know, is more important. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, that's super cool. I, I think I think the store is awesome. I know I'm always kind of gushing about it, and it's funny because you're like, for a guy that gushes so much about it, he he never he never comes in. <laughs> um, but it's not like that. I don't know. It's not like that. It's just one of those things where, uh, I mean, it was funny earlier tonight. Uh, my I said something to my wife, and I was like wanting to talk to her about something, and uh, she goes, "Oh, what, what did you want to talk about?" I was like, "Look, if I get a free minute sometime in the next." five or six days i'll bring it back up again <laughs> like mm-hmm. uh just being being one of those things and especially like even for us uh me and joe having to separate from what we do you know mm-hmm. i was joking before we went live that like it used to be so simple i would literally just drive down to joe's house i'd sit down in the chair behind him i would just talk and then leave and then my responsibility just ended you know right. <laughs> like like <laughs> right after that and obviously all, you know, for 12, I think the last episode that him and I did together was, um, it was actually for another punk band called The Blamed. And we did that, what was that, like February of 2020? Something like that. I've come down a couple of times for, for various little things, but um, but yeah, as far as this stuff goes, it's all been, it's all been home base. Um, mm. Obviously, it's much easier for us to survive doing everything remotely than it would be for a for a cash business. You know, mm-hmm. step one: get the equipment set up. Step two: teach Dan how to record himself. Step three: continue <laughs> making podcasts. <laughs> tell Dan to stop tapping on shit. Right. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> and talking to the mic, damn it! You guys yeah. hear that? Yeah, yeah. It's really weird when I talk over here. He gets real mad. I don't know what it is. I didn't hear a word you just said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, we, we've all kind of had to, had to learn how to kind mm-hmm. of adapt and cope and, and, and deal with all this stuff. Um, so I guess, you know, one of the things I like talking about too, as far as that sort of things, uh, those sort of things go, what have you guys been doing to keep, uh, just to keep it, just to kind of keep it fun, keep your, keep your minds occupied during some of the long stretches we all had to go through where there was just nothing, either nothing to do or nothing we could do. Practice. Yeah. <laughs> that's it is grinding it out you know our practices run long sometimes we might get there at eight and run till midnight one o'clock in the morning just oh. playing you know writing new shit yeah i picked up the uh i picked up my guitar a lot because it was, it was weird when we were in the six-week hold of not practicing because i was on a three-month hold of not traveling for my job and I've been basically traveling every other week since the end of 2015. And then all of a sudden 2020 hits and I'm home. I'm working from home. My wife's working from home. Like my, my dogs are like, why are you here all day? <laughs> yeah. Dogs are like, get out of here. I got, I got some stuff to do that, that, <laughs> yeah. I, don't, that I want you to see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's been a interesting trying time for, I think for everybody, you know, yeah, absolutely. I bought a three foot tall concrete Sasquatch statue. That was uh, my big COVID purchase when everybody was doing their, <laughs> you know, first three months. Ooh, uh, my crazy COVID expenditure. I was like, fuck it, I'm buying a concrete Sasquatch. Did you name it Harry? <laughs> I did not, but he does live uh, at, at the bottom of the stairs next to a piece of driftwood from uh, <laughs> from Alaska. Okay. We're about, to, we're about to plant some banana trees behind them, so it like kind of has a jungle setting. Yeah. So this is important. Um, what what kind of scale are we talking? You said life size. 
Ah, oh, geez, I wish I could afford the life size one. They have a they have a life size one that's about fifteen hundred. Okay, I, I opted for the one that's about three feet tall. Fair enough. So Fair. during COVID break, Kevin found Sasquatch. I did. He found Bigfoot. So he is real. Okay. Well, I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's a statue. It's accurate, right? I mean, it has it had to have been modeled after something that was real, right? All statues are of real things, right? <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it's definitely not a guy in a suit. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Welcome to our cryptozoology podcast. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, well, now now we're gonna Not totally that shift word again. <laughs> and go search for Sasquatch. Yeah. yeah, you immediately get more listeners than ever before. <laughs> I probably could throw like a hashtag cryptozoology, and then it's like we're dealing with like fifteen hundred, and they're like, "Why do they keep talking about this record store and and, and, and punk rock and local <laughs> venues? Like, when are you guys gonna talk about Bigfoot?" It's like, "Oh, just keep just keep watching. We'll talk about Bigfoot here uh, at, at the end." But. Yeah, uh, some podcasts do that. You 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 noticed, I'm sure. Uh, they'll say there's a subject, but the subject comes up for five minutes at the very end, and they just talk about the boring shit they were doing the last two weeks. Yep, yep. <laughs> we we we've been guilty of that a couple of times. I know yeah. one one episode we were there to talk about a band, and I immediately just started the conversation with, you know, hey Joe, the Mick Ribs back. I haven't had a McRib, and uh, we went on and on and on for about the McRib for like. I'm sure Joe cut a lot of that out, but it, there was more McRib talk in there than than there probably should have been. Yeah. We get accused of that all the time, though. Like, I'll see Reddit posts where somebody will say like, "Oh, uh, check out this podcast. They're talking about this band or whatever," and then there, oh, it never fails. Immediately, somebody jumps in there and is like, "Hey, uh." Just so you know, they don't start talking about the band until 22 minutes in. <laughs> well, sometimes you got to talk about Mick Ribs for 22 minutes. I mean, sometimes you just got to get it off your chest. You know, it's just it is what it is. Mick Ribs, Star Wars, more Mick Ribs. Yeah. How much Mc... beer can be consumed? Wait a second, that's a great idea, Don. I got a great idea for a show. This is for your next promotional campaign. Mm-hmm. Don kills this six pack. Yeah, I actually don't drink much anymore. Yeah, that's you why might... it'll be an un- an underground hit. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I'll do it right before I go on stage, so I can make an ass of myself. <laughs> the last time I actually drank a decent amount was our record release show, and everybody wanted to celebrate. You know, so it was like, uh, "Here, have a shot. Here, have a drink," and I was kind of chilling in the green room to you know not get too nervous because the room was filling up and it was an awesome turnout and so i went on stage lights went off and i put my foot on the stage and i realized i was drunk (laughs) i was like fuck (laughs) this is exactly what i don't want to (laughs) do so i'm like the first couple songs you're trying not to fuck up because you're well i am i'm not drunk i'm not having a good time i'm worried that i'm going to screw everything up because i'm drunk right (laughs) <laughs> which just you know back in the day you just hammer all the drinks and then fucking go over and fall fo- go out fall over and fall off the stage and it would be fucking great now you just worry <laughs> whenever you regain consciousness you're just like how we do you yeah <laughs> yeah so you know times have changed you know the only Absolutely. time i've ever fallen off the stage was when i was stone cold sober i had a 102 degree fever and i still played the show and was at the old creepy crawl in the middle of the summer pack show uh opening up for poison the well undying 12 tribes and code seven so there's no way in hell i was missing that show and right we got to the end of our set and just fucking nose dived off <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you never know what's going to happen at a show i mean uh punk rock flea market i think we almost all passed out from heat you know, heat exhaustion. Oh shit! Everything oh, was white. Damn. <laughs> Walking from the stage over to the ballroom to get a drink. Yeah, just black out. Yeah. Yeah. Once uh, I got off stage, I looked at our drummer and I was like, "Dude, you guys got this right." And I ran, got in a car, drove to like a McDonald's to get an air conditioning, drank like a, a frozen or iced tea or something to uh, not pass out from heat. It was fucking nuts. Well, our, our other guitar player got so drunk and so uh, heat exhausted that he slept through our second mm-hmm. set. Like, didn't even show up for a second set later that night. So we had to play a 
four piece it. Yeah, it was it was fun. Oh, uh, it's making me those. sick even thinking about it. Like booze and like 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 room temperature beer in a hundred degrees. Oh, yeah. So uh, you know that's the thrill of live shows. You never know what the hell's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, my old hardcore band played a show uh, two thousand three ish at once again the old creepy was a. Uh, it was the STL Punk Christmas show, and they decided it'd be a great idea to do the hardcore hour and had four hardcore bands do 15 minute back to back sets. You know, sharing nice. Them. And then I, I played the first set and the fourth set. And the fourth set, me and the singer in the band and both were like, hey, let's see how drunk we can get during our set. And we each agreed to. In, in 15, 15 minutes, minutes or less. <laughs> yeah. To drink a whole <laughs> bottle of liquor. He chose a bottle of Crown Royal. I chose a bottle of Night Train. And, which I don't know if you guys ever drank, but it's fucking terrible. Mm. <laughs> and I was already probably three pitchers deep before we played. And I drank the entire bottle of Night Train and almost passed out. Didn't have any strings left on my bass. My singer was fine. Found out two weeks later he filled the Crown Royal bottle with iced tea. Oh, come on. That's cheating. Yeah. <laughs> That's cheating. You're lucky to be alive after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, the the night ended with um, an ER drunk. visit. No, 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 no. That would have been not as funny. But <laughs> me trying to stab a kid over a sweater, and then my girlfriend at the t- my girlfriend at the time was taking me back to my apartment where my mom was in town, and was, she was going to meet my girlfriend for the first time. So she had to take me to the courtesy diner to try to sober me up. And all I would do is drink coffee and eat jelly toast that was piled high with sugar. Uh-huh. Good she, times. She dumped me on my doorstep and left. I bet. Which was the correct move. Yeah. Do you guys yeah. miss playing in a band yet? <laughs> uh, sometimes. Uh, not, not recently. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I see we, a lot of guitars behind Joe. Fuck yeah, dude. He can play every single one of them, too. Nice. I can't. I, I was never. There I was never so talented. I just there you sang. Go. Yeah. Nice. I didn't really even sing. If we needed like really good, pretty sounding singing, Joe had to do it. Basically, the way the rule works is if something hard has to be done, Joe has to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Record, mix, master. So play the guitars. Play the bass. Play the fucking yeah. drums. This yeah. should be uh, featuring Joe. Is what the show should be called. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah, we, we have its talents always on display. I mean, I, hey, I set the stream up. I set the, the, you know, I uploaded a background file and, you know, <laughs> the program did the rest. <laughs> hey, you sent out a couple emails. I sent a couple emails out. I talked to Don very infrequently on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, I, the fact that the fact that I did a good enough job for anybody to even show up is, you know, <laughs> fantastic. How long did you guys take off? Good job, Dan. We didn't. Yeah. Believe it or not, doing we, it separately. So it started rough. So it was we started recording because one one of the biggest uh, things about our podcast was the the sound quality. We were always really proud of the sound quality, mm-hmm. and most of that had to do with the fact that it was us in the same room, you know, with those microphones and all that. And basically, I was talking into a crappy USB mic into a really crappy like 2015 macbook air and um i would just record i would just like record my voice into garage band while we were talking on skype and so we wouldn't use the skype audio we would just use that and then uh i was able to procure like basically one part at a time a, a relatively decent like i guess you would call it a gaming computer because it plays games really well but the main reason we built the computer was so that I could do like live streams and, and recording and stuff like that. And so then Joe had to get me a, get me a, a USB interface so that I could use a real microphone instead of a USB microphone. Mm-hmm. And um, it just kind of blossomed from there. Um, and we just kind of started realizing that we could do a lot of our stuff remotely. And so we, we were able to kind of stack everything in such a way to where, um, I want to say all through 2020, we did like what two, two episodes per per session. Let's put it this way: we're on episode 217 of the podcast, plus discuss metal, plus mm-hmm. frags per second, 
plus all the live streams that you've been doing late at night. So we actually didn't decrease at all. We actually increased, I think. Nice. Yeah, and I wasn't. Uh, <clears throat> I worked pretty consistently through uh, through the whole pandemic because mm -hmm. my actual day job is repairing breathing machines and breathing equipment. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we, I was the essentialist of employees uh, <laughs> during all of that. Um, Joe, I think actually you you worked from home, didn't you, Joe, for a while? For quite a while, especially when everything started, but. I'm one of those people that's very lucky I did not miss a day of work and your internet is better because of it. Nice. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> he, work, he works for a major uh, major provider, so it's uh it's really um helpful <laughs> to, yeah, to have I'm, that. I'm sure your job got harder. <laughs> a Everybody bit. at home. Somewhat. Just depends yeah. on see I, I don't mind the work from home ethic. I don't mind the work from home approach because i'm very capable of self-motivating mm -hmm. i realize not everybody is but for those people sometimes i just want to shake them and say guys it's it's not high school just mm -hmm. do your damn job <laughs> <laughs> i felt Some bad for not, they're not cut out for it i i work from home every monday and it took me a while to get in, get used to it but it's it's i'm actually more productive on my mondays than when i had to go into the office yeah yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Me, there's too many shiny, distracting things at home. I'd never be able to get anything done if I was just down here. Plus, I've got I've got a wife and four kids, so like that, I'd never be able to get anything done if I was working mm -hmm. remotely. Uh, <laughs> somehow we get we get the podcasts and the live streams and stuff done just because we do them late at night after everybody's asleep. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah so it really up. wasn't too bad. We we did basically persevere throughout and. Um, it was surprising actually to get emails from people and stuff being like, thank you so much for continuing to do the show because it's the only thing like we've been binging. It's weird getting messages from people that are like, yeah, I've been listening to nothing but your show for two days now. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? And they're like, I was like, that's, that's too much. Maybe you should take a break or something. And they're like, no, seriously, there's nothing else to do. I can't go to work. Right. I can't go out and hang out with my friends. I can't do anything. You know? Yeah. Makes it all worth it, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I worked uh, 20 years selling stuff online. So working from home was what I did. And uh, that was one of the things I had to consider was going back to online sales uh, with this break. And instead, I just decided to gut the back room and build a horror room and focus on the store and not do online sales. Um, oh, yeah. You know, do something else with my time and try to be more productive in other ways. Um, but yeah, I just kind of had to refocus. But working from home isn't really an option. I don't want to do that ever. <laughs> yeah. I want to be outside and doing things where people can be, but, you know, in, in the right time, you know. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So how do you guys, uh, how are you doing with uh, vaccinations? Did you get that done? Not yet. Um, I need to. It's funny because I work. The, the place that I work actually is contracted by the government to fix, like have a certain amount of ventilators mm -hmm. on hand and stuff. So I think we're supposed to be getting, we're supposed to be getting them at work. Like one day I'm just going to go in, it's going to be vaccination day. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, like half the people that are there, half the people that get the vaccinations will probably have to go home, you know, because I know it's, it's been real hit or miss with, with my friends and family that have gotten it. Um, some people are like, yeah, I got my vaccination and I feel great. And then there's some people that are like, yeah, I, I feel really bad. And I, I was sick for like 24 hours, but then it mm -hmm. all went away. I guess I'm good now. Um, but yeah, I think because my parents are vaccinated, I think my sister is, I think my brother is, but um, I'm the only holdout. And it's really just been, again, like a timing thing where it's like I have to be at work every day at a certain time. So like a lot of the times when these things are available, I, I'm not. <laughs> mm -hmm. So hopefully, Joey, did you get vaccinated already? I am on the list. Oh, okay. okay. Just Fair waiting enough. for my turn. Nice. Yeah, I, I heard there was walk-in stuff where you could just go to whatever building and get the new shot. I had to yeah. drive what, six hours round trip twice to do it. <laughs> Went out to the middle of nowhere where people weren't getting it um, to, to get on that. Somebody's got their first dose in there. Yeah. I, uh, I went to Cape Girardeau for, for both of mine and 
I was actually, for the second dose, I was expecting a bad reaction just because I had spent the previous 16 days in Fort Worth working nonstop, setting up a store, and then drove 10 hours home just to sleep for a few hours to get up and drive down to Cape and get it and then come home, and I was cool. Yeah. Do they do it on the weekends, too? Because I could probably swing out on a Saturday and just get it done. But I'm trying to schedule it on the weekend, too, anyway, because I don't want to miss work. Uh, my job's actually, like in a weird way, like kind of fun. Like I just enjoy working on the machines. Mm. Dan is a workaholic. I I don't know about all that, but I I do. uh, (laughs) I mean, if it was up to me, I'd just be independently wealthy and not work at all, you know, and just do podcasts. Right. But, um, but yeah, I I don't, I really enjoy the work and I don't want to like, they kind of have given us a little, because, because we provide ventilators for the actual government. uh, We all kind of have this like superhero complex. (laughs) <laughs> you know where we're like if we miss and they, they don't guilt us or anything they don't make us feel bad like if we get mm-hmm. sick or something you know but like th- there's this certain feeling of like i'm gonna go out and save some lives today right. <laughs> you know <laughs> and uh so yeah that's that's what keeps us going so like none of the last thing any of us any of us really wants to do is miss work right. um which i think is why they're i think the government's actually going to provide us with a, with a certain amount of vaccinations um mm-hmm. I'm just not sure when that's going to happen. Yeah. It's a, I can tell you that when you go to these uh, locations, like Kevin and I went to, it's like every sci-fi movie you've ever seen where everybody oh, yeah. goes to like some kind of gymnasium fallout type thing. It just yeah. lines of people, doctors everywhere, tables in a gymnasium. It's pretty wild. At oh, least so wow. the second half of ET then. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Where they like turn the house into a laboratory. <laughs> yeah, you're just standing in this room with all of these other people, you know, waiting to get this vaccine from this, you know, worldwide pandemic disease. It's, it's pretty fucking gnarly. Something we, I don't think any of us could have ever guessed we'd have to deal with. <clears throat> the weirdest experience for me through all this was um, my mother-in-law made uh, made masks for all of us. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, she just made them at home or whatever. Um, and we took a family photo of all of us wearing masks and like thumbs upping and all this stuff or whatever. And I was like, and I was looking at the picture and then like, of course my wife posted it on Facebook and, um, and all that. It's like, Oh yeah, look at our mask that my mom, it was like, it was like the most innocent thing, but I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here like looking at this picture and I'm like, what kind of dystopian hellscape am I living in right now? (laughs) Like, like where we, you know, where we can't go outside without wearing our protective masks. And it's not that like, I wasn't taking it seriously. I was, I was thankful that she made those for us, but just looking at the picture with no context, is just like, what, like, what is going on here? Yep. You know? Yeah. It's definitely been an interesting uh, time since the last time we were on your podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I appreciate you bringing us back on. This is cool. Yeah, man, this is a lot of fun, and I, I love I love catching up. I like talking about the geeky things more than anything else. Just uh, <laughs> one of those uh, one of those things. And and I I I need to get up and hang at the store more often. I just I gotta have gotta find. Gotta well, if you guys time. are uh, going out, uh, we are playing the show at Red Flag. So yeah, yeah, we could do that. It's definitely uh, they take it super serious, you know. Yeah. They don't they don't fuck around. I think I'm at a buddy's birthday party earlier on in the day, so that would actually be a really good cap off. Mm-hmm. And you can uh, see the new venue. Day. You haven't been in there yet, have you? No, no, I haven't. Definitely yeah, not. It's, it's gorgeous. So, so Joe, mark the calendar. We'll just go up there and have ourselves a good time. Now, now for the show, is there still like tickets available? I don't know what like Max. Yeah, uh, you can uh, get it. tickets from me. I have some here at the shop. Okay, uh, you can get them online at uh, Red Flags website. Uh, okay. The capacity actually went up. Yeah, I think it's about twenty percent now. Something like that. You know, we're still cool to keep it at around a hundred. <laughs> you know, sure. yeah. same as last time. We don't need to uh, have an outbreak for any reason. Yeah, keep it cool. Yeah, absolutely. No, no super spreader events here. Mm-mm. Um, so. No, this is in St. Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna come up there. I'm gonna come up there and be all like, "Yeah, okay, everybody, come on in." Wait, except for Dan. He told me the other night that he was not vaccinated. So, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's well, I mean, over. that's that's if you pass the uh, the forehead scan, you got to get your temperature taken at the door. Yeah, but the forehead scans. Yeah. So I, I got something interesting about those. Those are not accurate 
at least not the ones that my at least not the ones that my work uses mm -hmm. because I regularly yeah, yeah. pull a, I regularly pull a temperature of like ninety six point two degrees, and I'm like, so that's that's not healthy mm -hmm. either. Like I shouldn't be that cold. Like I'm basically a dead person. <laughs> I got it beat, dude. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, return to the dead. That, right. Because I'd almost be more worried about somebody that I'd almost be more worried about somebody that, that rocked a solid ninety eight point six on one of those things. So I'd be all like, so that's two degrees higher. So if they really were at ninety eight, they'd be at like a hundred, right? Like trying to trying to do the temperature math. But uh, right. you know, we can't exactly. I'm guessing they're mostly just looking for people that are like at a hundred and three or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, some extreme. <clears throat> I had one day where I almost got sent home from work because I it was really cold and I drove up uh, with my heater on and I drive this old crappy van so like um, the heater mm -hmm. was like really hot like almost like sparks coming out of it like onto my face and I was cool I was toasty but then whenever they went and did the forehead scan when I went into work they were all like dude <laughs> they all start backing up or whatever and yeah. I'm like what you know so they they had me they had me just sit there. Uh, they had, they had me sit there just in the front of the building for like 20 minutes, like sitting at room temperature. And then I took my temperature again. They're like, you're sure you're not feeling bad. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Like, they're like, oh, mm. okay, but we're watching you. We're going to come back in an hour and take your temperature again. You know, <laughs> like, yep. You know, speaking of metal stuff though, <clears throat> uh, we may, the record label may be releasing a new record from one of St. Louis's, coolest metal bands really I'll leave it at that it's a little teaser okay <laughs> we'll talk about that when it gets closer to time i think we'll talk we'll get the we'll band talk about on. that next time yeah yeah there's a there's a lot of releases coming and exclusives we're doing like fear uh there's an exclusive time and pressure record uh color coming um and then okay. the new bastard squad band called fight back mountain which we already announced um, so we're slowly getting into the swing of uh, consecutive releases coming out constantly through this year. That's so awesome. that's another thing that I've been working on is just <laughs> mixing records, producing stuff, and you know preparing things for the record label, which uh, goes into what Kevin was saying way earlier about trusting a record label with what they put out, you know. Sure. Um, so I've been kind of curating what I think would be cool within the local scene and uh, even some reissues I'll be announcing soon. That's awesome. So you definitely want to uh, you definitely want to be following Don on Instagram. Is Instagram kind of your main your main uh, yeah. social right now? I know at one point you sent a message being like, hey, direct all your messages to the Instagram. page." Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's because uh, somehow in November, December, when I guess everything changed the algorithms for how they banned people for posts or whatever, somehow yeah. I got thrown in under the bus with something. And uh, I think it was like January that gave me some prove your identity nonsense, which oh, I went boy. through all the stuff. I did it. And they said, uh, because of COVID, they don't have enough employees to constantly check everybody who's getting these warnings. And if yeah. it lapsed over 30 days and they didn't prove your identity, uh, they would delete all of your shit. And they did that to me. Oh, they deleted wow. okay. everything, all of my personal, my businesses, everything. It just all vanished. That's crazy. So, yeah, it's all on Instagram. <laughs> okay. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, you can follow the record space on uh, on Instagram and you can obviously follow Bastard Squad um, for, for announcements. And this is not the last time we're going to talk. We're local, you know. And uh, like I said, it would it'd be really cool for us to come up to the shop sometime and, and, and do something yeah. like this uh, in person. So Yeah, and um, where he's got uh, our Spotify pulled up. Is that what that is? Bandcamp. Bandcamp. Oh, Bandcamp. So, yeah, on um, Friday, April 24th or 3rd, uh, all streaming channels will have our new live record. So you can check out the Alexian sessions on Spotify, uh, Bandcamp, all that and there's some new songs on there too. It's not just it's not yeah. There's just a couple live, of new ones. New album songs, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got two songs, uh, which we're actually recording for real tomorrow for a yet to be announced upcoming release. And if you go to bastardsquadstl.com, that takes you to our link tree where you can find links to everything we got going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
uh, including us, right? We were the newest addition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, guys, you guys are at the top of the list right now. Oh, man. We got to capitalize that on, on that as, as quickly as we can. Yeah. Um, but guys, thanks so much for coming on. This is a lot of fun, and um, it's the only time. It's the only way I, I get to talk to people anymore. Really, is right. is is doing one of these, you know. And I I, re- I wish we could have done it in person, uh, like we did last time. I think that that was the coolest thing is that Don was the first person that we ever interviewed in person on on oh, on, po- nice. on a podcast because um, he was just like, yeah. I mean, I'm not doing anything. I'll just drive down, you know. <laughs> so. Uh, so, so we did it and it was, it was a lot of fun. It, it was a lot of fun. So, um, absolutely for sure. Uh, make sure you guys are checking out the record space, checking out everything bastard squad has going on. And, uh, this is not the last we will hear no. from Don and Kevin. Let's do something at the shop here. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Definitely. <laughs>